If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. George, I think I'm a little hot on this uh, mic. Turn me down a little bit. Revelation chapter 17. We're continuing to look at what is called here in chapter 17, religious Babylon. And uh, hopefully you have been able to understand this because of this book, the book of Revelation, Jesus said in Revelation 1 and verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. And if you remember when we started uh, in chapter 1 in January of 2018, we looked at the outline that was given of this book and it's also found in chapter 1 and verse 19. It says, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. And so that verse, verse chapter 1 and verse 19 is the outline for the entire book. The things that John saw, <clears throat> that it says there, things which he's seen, covered chapter 1. The things which are, which are, they, it addressed the seven churches. We saw that in chapters 2 and 3. And the things which will take place um, begins with chapter 14, chapter 4, and goes all the way through the end of the book. And a part of the things that are the things of the end are a series of judgments called seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and bowl judgments. And in this section that we're in, the last bowl judgment has already been poured out. And uh, Jesus is about to come back in chapter 19. We'll see that. But before John writes about that, before he writes about the return of Christ, um, he is letting us know about this one world religion that we see in chapter 17. And he's letting us know how this one world religion and this one world government that's in chapter uh, 18, how they come to an end. Remember we said chapter 17, the events of the one world religion uh, takes place in the middle of the tribulation would have happened before this, but he puts chapter 17 and chapter 18 together for us to be able to see how they interact with each other and how they come to an end. And so this is not history that I'm reading to you. Um, this is the future to come. This deals with the time of the end of the world. And so with that said, we, we left off last time at verse 6. You remember what he said in verse 6? He says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wandered greatly. And he says, he wandered greatly. Remember the word wandered is a strong word and it, it takes him back because he's never seen anything like this. And so what we see here in Revelation chapter 17 is a picture of a one world religion. And then again, chapter 18 is a picture of a one world government and the destruction of both of them are seen in these two chapters. Again, even though they don't happen in sequence, the destruction of the one world government takes place when Christ comes back. And John brings these two together in these chapters. And so as we look at this, um, let's, let's look at um, verse 1 of chapter 17. He wants us to know, um, we saw the bold judgments were, were, were thrown down to the earth. And he looks at these one of these seven angels. Look at verse 1. He says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and spoke to me saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. And so <clears throat> this woman is the representation here of this religious system and her evil influence has reached to all the peoples, including the highest levels that he calls kings here. And, um, and so as we continue with this chapter, we're going to continue to look at this. And I want us to see about this metaphorical woman and about the beast that is mentioned here. Remember, the beast 
is the Antichrist, all right? Satan's never, he's not called a beast, he's called Satan. You have the beast who's the Antichrist, and you have the false prophet, all right? That's the unholy trinity. And so if you're taking notes, there's a note-taking outline in your bulletin. I want us to see the beast carries the woman first. The beast carries the woman. And we see here in verse 6, we'll pick up again where we left off, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wandered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wander? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And again, the the... The woman here uh, is symbolic of this church, this one world church, this one world religion. And he says in verse 6 that this, this one world tr church is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. This church, this one world church persecuted the saints of God. And so John then in verse 7 sees this woman riding on the beast and he's wondering what is going on. And that's why the angel in verse 7 says to him, you don't need to wonder what this is all about because I'm going to tell you what it's all about. You don't have to wonder for too long. But the interesting thing is that the explanation that follows um, from verses 8 through 17 will tell us more about the beast than it does the woman. He doesn't really get back to the woman until we get to verse 18, even though we had seen some about her in verses 1 through 6. And we learn here that she's not carrying the beast, but that the beast is carrying her. You see that in verse 7? He says, and the angel said, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her her. And um, it's, it's we, typically when we think about it, um, we, we, if we're on a beast, we're controlling it. If you ever rode an animal, a donkey or a horse, you're controlling this beast. In this case, it's the beast that's controlling her. And so as we'll see, um, again, the beast is symbolic and refers to the Antichrist, and the woman represents this false church. And the Antichrist, he carries this false religion, and in the end, he will destroy it. Look at verse 7, and the angel said, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now notice he says mystery here. He's talking about a mystery. He doesn't say mysteries. It's not plural. It's singular. It's one mystery. It's not the church who's ruling alone, or it's not the Antichrist who's ruling alone. At this point, it's they're ruling together. And so it's, it's one mystery. They're ruling together. They're cooperating. The one world religion and the one world government, they're cooperating. It's not two mysteries here. And so they're using each other for their mutual benefits. And so if you know about a mystery in scripture, a mystery is something that was hidden and then revealed at some later point. And this mystery of how these two entities could be cooperating, it gets John's attention. And he says he wondered about it. And he's, 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 he's puzzled about how the, this church that's killing the saints and how this government that is sanctioning that, how they're cooperating and how they're getting together. Now, I don't know if you pay attention to it or not. But we're starting to see some similarities today between this uh, church and government cooperation for mutual benefit and how people are using it. You, we see today where politicians align themselves with churches or even with certain pastors to try and get votes. But it's not just the politicians that are trying to use uh, the other person. Sometimes the pastors are using the politicians as well. Or the religious leaders. They love the limelight. Or the status 
that aligning with those certain politicians might bring. And so they bring their churches along um, into some of these uh, cooperation. Now, I have a rule about talking about politics in church, not so much about political issues, because sometimes political issues tend to come up as you're dealing with stuff in the scripture, but on taking sides. I don't like to do it because it's too divisive, right? I did it once and I won't do it again, right? Um, but let me give you an illustration of how the church and the state can align based on what we see happening today. And I pay attention to a whole lot of things um, that's going on out, out there. But for example, we've seen that our current president and certain evangelical pastors have aligned themselves. Some of them for status and being in the inner circle and others because it might influence the, the pick of judges on federal courts or the Supreme Court. And yes, it's a good thing to have godly judges on the courts, I'm not disputing that. But for some of these leaders, that's all they care about. They only have one agenda because these same leaders don't say a word about immoral actions. Now, that's as much as I'll say about that because on the same token, you see uh, the president using these leaders to get the evangelical votes. And so I bring all of this up to say, and I think you get the point, that the religious and the political can use each other. That's what's happening here in chapter 17. We're starting to see signs of it even today in our world, in our own country and in our world about how the political wants to use the religious for their influence and how the religious wants to use the political for their influence. Now, in case you're wondering, and maybe you are not, or maybe you are, I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I'm a Christocrat. <laughs> um, actually, I'm a registered independent because I don't want to align myself with one political party. But I mention all of that because we see a glimpse today of how the state will try to control the religion and how religion tries to benefit from it. That's what we see here. And so he says in verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And so he says, the beast comes out of the abyss. This is the pit, if you remember where um, some angels are now residing. But what is interesting here is the difference between um, in the origin of the beast here from the one that's in chapter 13. Hold your finger here and turn back to chapter 13 of uh, Revelation. If you go back to chapter 13 and look at verse 1, it says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now, in chapter 13, it says he comes up from the sea. Do you remember what the sea was? We talked about it. It's humanity. It's speaking of, sometimes we say that, we say, look at that sea of humanity or the sea of people out there. And so the sea generally refers to Gentiles. And so his humanity is emphasized here. But here in this chapter, he's described as coming out of the abyss in, in chapter 17. And so this tells us that the devil is going to find the Antichrist and this will find in him a willing subject. And it's not a contradiction because this man, the Antichrist, will be empowered by the devil himself. We see this in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because in that chapter, Paul writes to the Christians who were under some severe persecution and a lot of them took the, the, the belief that since we're under the persecution, it must mean that the day of the Lord had come. And Paul reminds them in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. 
And he tells them that they were not in the day of the Lord because the great falling away has not happened as yet, nor has this man of lawlessness come. Look at how this man of lawlessness is described. This is the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2.9. That is the one who is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. He is a man that is empowered by the devil himself both from the abyss and from the people. Now, stay in chapter 13, keep your finger there and flip back to chapter 17 and look at the rest of verse 8. He says, The beast who you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose names has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not, and will come. Now, what is the the purpose here of this man? It is to deceive. And John reminds us there in that verse that the beast is the Antichrist. And he, he's, his purpose is to deceive people. Now, if you looked at the people who he will deceive, he is deceiving the Christ-rejecting people of this world. He will deceive all of those who have made a profession of faith, but do not have a possession of faith. All the cults who rejected the truth, all the people from the various isms who have sought other ways of getting to God. um, He will deceive those people. Now, you notice it talks about in verse 8 of chapter 17, all those whose names were not written in the book of life. Now, this is mentioned twice in the book of Revelation. Here in chapter 17 and in chapter 13, verse 8, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. And so the only thing I have to say about that is that God, in his foreknowledge, He knew who would be saved and he wrote their names in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. But there are other people whose names were not written in the book of life, not because God didn't want them to be saved, but because God knew they would not be saved. These are the people here in this verse who are now being in awe of the beasts. And they buy what he says, hook, line, and sinker, and they will embrace this false Christ that comes. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. The thought is that these folks, they love their evil deeds. They know the plan of salvation, but they did not know the man of salvation. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.11 says, for this reason... What reason? Because they love their evil deeds. They didn't come to the truth so as to be saved. And so for this reason, God will send up on them a deluding influence so that they will believe what, in fa- what is false. And so in some senses, God does this already today. But at that time, God will do this in a large way. These people who've rejected the truth, you got to look back at 2 Thessalonians 2.10. They love their evil ways. They rejected the truth to be saved. God sends up on them. They first take the first step by rejecting Christ. And then God sends up on them a deluding influence. So they'll believe what is false. And in, at that time, it will be part of God's judgment. They will be deceived. And so he says back in Revelation chapter 17... Um, And verse 8, at the end of the verse, they will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. They said that at the beginning of the verse already. Those unbelievers will wonder in awe about the Antichrist. What will they wonder about? They will wonder about the beast. Look at at the end of the verse, it says that he was and is not and will come. What is this referring to? Flip back to chapter 13, look at verse 3. 
it says of the beast, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. You see that word slain there in verse three of chapter 13? It means slaughtered to death. Um, he is killed here. It's the same word used back in chapter five where, uh, if you remember, where John uh, saw the, the lamb um, standing as if slain. Remember that? And, and this is the, he bore the marks of death. And so here is the beast. He was dead, but then he was brought back to life. And we have to know that Satan can do miracles. We see that throughout the scriptures. Um, and it's possible that he could empower this man to, to bring him back to life. And I think that's what happened. Satan raised him from the dead. But I want you to pay attention to the word raised versus the word resurrection or resurrected. All right. There's a difference between there. There are eight people in all the Bible who were raised to life. And all of them were raised to life. None of them were resurrected to life. Lazarus, who was dead for four days and in the grave, was raised back to life only to die again sometime later. And his body's in a grave somewhere. But Jesus, on the other hand, is the first person to be resurrected to life. There's a difference there. Never to die again. He is the first fruit of all of those who will be later on at some point resurrected to life, never to die again. And so while Satan may be able to raise the Antichrist, he will not resurrect the Antichrist. That power belongs only to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, I think what, that what is possible is that the way that he is raised to life is that he is filled with, with demons and these demons will energize his body and he will go around being this demon possessed guy. Now go back to chapter 17 and we'll stay there. That's what he's saying at the end of verse eight, that he was and is not and will come. And because he was raised to life, he will have the world's attention. And all of these people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life that he talks about here in verse 8, will worship him. And that is why the beast is carrying the woman. He will use her, and once he is done with her, he will destroy her. Now notice also, secondly, in your notes, the beast and the woman's city. So we see the beast carrying the woman. He's using her. He's controlling her. She's not controlling him. The government is controlling the church. They're ruling together. And then we see the city here, the city of this one world religion. Look at verse 9. The angel says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, he begins by saying, here's the mind that has wisdom, which means that there is something here that's perhaps difficult about it. But if you have an understanding mind, if you have a wise mind, you can understand it. He says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, remember, um, he had talked about um, this in verse three of chapter 17. And it says, yeah, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. There's that church state thing again, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and 10 horns. And so he talks about it there. And now he's in the section where he's explaining it. And so he says, the seven heads that you saw are seven mountains on which the woman sits. To the first century mind, and we have to transport ourselves back to the first century, to their mind, this could only refer to one thing or one place. What's that one place? It's the city of Rome. Not Worcester. Worcester has seven hills, um, but Rome is considered the city of seven mountains, even though sometimes they call it seven hills. 
But in verse 18, it is called the great city. And in verse 9, it says it is built on seven mountains. But the important thing is that there will be a church-state relationship that will be tied to Rome. This is not Iraq, where the original Babylon was. That's where that was, modern-day Iraq. And you might be asking the question, why can't this be Babylon? Why can't this be the original Babylon? Because of prophecy against that, that that would be the case. Listen to Isaiah 13, 17. Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. And their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldean pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What was that like? It was destroyed. It will never be inhabited or lived in for generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. Now, as you know, Saddam Hussein, when he was alive, he tried to rebuild this. He started rebuilding Babylon. But the, that never worked out. No one will live there. And so if it's not original Babylon that's being talked about here in, in, in verse 9, could it be New York City? Well, if you read the Left Behind series, which is a good series, by the way, they put the Antichrist in New York City at the UN. But remember, in verse 5, it calls it Mystery Babylon. This means that it's not the obvious choices that we might think it would be, but something that needs to be interpreted. Even Peter, he used that name when he wrote to the church. Listen to 1 Peter 5.13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Peter wasn't talking about ancient Babylon here, nor was he in New York City that I know of. But in the first century, that was the name that they used for Rome. It was a code name. We use code names also when we speak of, in the news they say, Wall Street does this. What are they talking about? New York City. Or we might say, and the White House said, the White House didn't talk. They're talking about the president, right? And so we use code names as well. And so it's a code word. Plus down in verse 18, it says, the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. The woman we've learned, again, is a one world religion, but also a city, as it says here. And so this is Rome. Look at verse 10. And they are seven kings... Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And so we learn that the seven heads are seven mountains, who also pictures seven kings. What's the point of this verse? Let's read it again. And they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. Now listen carefully. There are seven kings total. We already saw that the city is built on seven mountains. We said that's Rome. And he says that there are seven kings total. Five are already fallen, meaning that they have come and they've gone off the scene. And then in the middle of verse 10, it says, one is, meaning that this person is alive at the time that John is writing this. And then he says, the seventh is yet to come. And, and as this tells us, he, he will only come the, for a little while. And then another, as we will see when we get to the next verse, we'll see the eighth, who is the Antichrist. Now, there have been many attempts to try and align who, who these kings might be to other kings that have come along and, um, and have ser served in Roman history. But it's, it's almost impossible because there have been so many kings in, in Roman history that it's hard to decide who to put in and who to leave out. 
But maybe another way to look at this, and most commentators take this position, is that these kings stand for seven kingdoms that are associated with these kings. And that position goes well with the book of Daniel. If you remember, we studied that now, goodness, we started four years ago or so on Daniel, and we looked at this. And, and, and it goes well with Daniel, that position. It goes well with secular history. Because up to that time that John writes, there were five kingdoms or five major Gentile nations that succeeded one after the other. Remember them? Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Media Persia, and Greece. Five past kingdoms. And then he describes a six that is current at the time that John is writing. And that is the Roman kingdom that John was writing at that time. Then he describes the seventh that will come. And from Daniel, remember, that's why we studied Daniel first, is that we knew that we, it had to give us some of the keys to the lock of, of Revelation. And it's clear from Daniel that this is the revived Roman Empire. And he says in the verse, look at verse 10 again. And they are seven kings, five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. So we talked about Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Media Persia, and Greece. They came one after the other, all right? And during John's time, there was a Roman Empire. They were ruling the world. And then he says at the end of verse 10, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. Now, it will only be a short time. And that's biblical because we learn from the Bible that Rome is going to reemerge in the last days. And when you put Daniel together with Revelation, we learn that this revived Roman Empire has strong ties with the one world religion. And both of them are tied with the city of Rome. Now, it's very interesting what has taken place in that part of the world, just in some of our own lifetimes. You know, you, you, can, you can watch the news and see some stuff play out. For example, in 1957, the European common market was formed under what was called the Treaty of Rome. And it was accelerated in 1993 when it became the European Union. In 1998, the European Central, European Central Bank was formed. Then in 1999, an official military power was beginning to be established in that cooperation. In January 2002, it instituted its dollar called the euro. It came into being. And then also in 2002, there was talk about making Rome the capital of the European Union. Now, while that didn't happen yet, it was talked about. Now, is this EU, the group, is that who this 10 nation thing is going to be? I don't know. It's possible. We, don't, we can't necessarily read into that and say that's going to be the case. Um, but it's very possible. But we see some of these things happen. He says in verse 11, The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. What does this mean? It means that out of one of the seven, an eighth kingdom will come and will represent the kingdom of the beasts. But this kingdom is short-lived, as we saw in verse 10, because of the return of Christ. Christ comes back and he squashes that kingdom. And that's exactly what Paul tells us back in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. He's going to keep going. Christ will come and he'll say, you're done. And he'll slay him. He's done. Now, did you get all that? You may have to go back 
And this is what we were talking about in Sunday school this morning with the Bereans, right? They looked at the scriptures. They studied it to see what it was. And so you may have to go online and get this and look at it and study it again, right? Unless you want me to just go over that part again. No? All right, let's move on. Um, listen, look at verse 12. He says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beasts for one hour. The beast not only has seven heads, but he has ten horns, which are ten kings. And this is a short-lived kingdom. It says at the end of the verse that it lasts only one hour. It doesn't mean that it's one hour. It's just a literal hour. It means it's a short time. It's a short-lived kingdom. Now, if this is the EU, we will see. We don't know. But the number of members has fluctuated greatly over the years. It's gone from 10 to 13. When it was 10, people said, there it is. Christ is going to come back right now. Then it went to 13. And I think it's over 20 now. But if this is the group, either before the rapture or after the rapture, there will be 10 nations. Then John tells us that there will be 10 kings. Not unlike the seven heads, uh, uh, or unlike the seven heads that we saw in verse, verse 9, um, that rule, they will rule in succession. We talked about Egypt and all those other kingdoms who, who ruled um, one after each other. Um, these ten kings at this time will rule simultaneously. And that is interesting because even though the, the EU, and let's just use that as an example, even though they're united as a group, they still have sovereignty. They still have presidents and prime ministers and they rule separately. But, but here in this case, that what we're seeing is they, they, these are ten kings ruling all together, but they give their power to the Antichrist. Look at the verse 13. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beasts. Why is it that they give their power to the Antichrist? Verse 14. These will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Now, did you know that we're going to witness all of this? Did you see us in that verse? It says, though, you know, it's talking about Christ as he's coming back. He's the Lord of Lords and he's the King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and the faithful. We're going to be coming back on these white horses and just witnessing Christ take care of this stuff. We don't need to do a thing. We just witness him destroy the Antichrist. But it says in the beginning of verse 14, they have one goal. And that is to wage war against the Lamb. And we'll read more about that when we come to chapter 19. But notice thirdly in your notes, the beast comes to destroy the woman. We talked about the fact that he's using her um, and then he destroys her. Look at verse 15. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What's he referring to? Back in verse 1, he says, then one of the angels who had the seven bowls, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. He's explaining it. Again, the first half of the chapter, he's, he's talk, giving this symbolism, and now he's explaining it in verse 16. He says, Come, I'll tell you. And, um, and so it refers to the peoples of the world. And he says, there are multitudes and nations and tongues. Verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw and the beasts, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. This is saying that the Antichrist will use the religious lost people of the world to accomplish his purposes. But once he has used uh, this one world religion who's riding on his back, he's going to dispose of her. She will not be able to exist any longer. Simply put, the honeymoon is over. Now, remember, we saw back in verse 5 that she's called the mother of harlots. There is, there's religious pluralism here. That's the idea. She's the mother of many harlots or the mother of many religions or many churches or many practices. 
We talked about last time that those coexist bumper stickers will continue because all these isms, all, they'll cooperate. They'll come together um, under this one world religion. They'll be able to cooperate. Yeah, it will be ecumenism at its highest. But the Antichrist doesn't want that. And that's what we see here in, in verse 16. And he wants to get rid of anything that will be in competition with him. Remember, he's coming under the power of the devil, who is the biggest egomaniac of them all. Why did Satan fall? Because he's an egomaniac, pride. And, and it was pride that caused his fall. And he has always wanted to be worshipped. Go read Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. It talks about that, right? And it was pride that caused him to fall. He wanted to worship. He wanted to, to sit even above God. We see in those two passages. And so the devil at this time, he will seek worship. He will seek that worship through the Antichrist. So again, you have this unholy trinity. You have Satan, you have the Antichrist, and you have the false prophet who kind of represents the Holy Spirit. He wants to have his own trinity. And so as we worship Christ, we're worshiping God. And so he, people will worship the Antichrist, they'll really be worshiping uh, Satan. It says in verse 16, And the beasts, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. He's in essence saying, I'm getting her off my back. I'm tired of her. And so for him, it's purely a marriage of convenience here. What's convenient about it? Well, think about the things that he'll need. The Antichrist. He's going to need the money that's found in religious systems. And he's going to need the influence that's found in these religious systems. Once he gets the money, and once he's gotten the influence, he's going to dump her. Because he will want solo worship. He's the devil's man. The devil wants solo worship. The Antichrist is the devil's man. He wants solo worship. But if you think about it, all of this happens under the sovereign will of God. God allows it to happen. Look at verse 17. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. Basically, God is using the devil's own axe to cut off the devil's own head. That's what he's doing here, which God was going to do anyways. But he brings the axe to the thing and God uses it to cut off his own heads and he allows the devil to poison himself. Now, we know that God is working everything for good, and he will use the evil of men for his own purposes. Don't get me wrong. He's never the author of sin, but he'll use sin in a sinless way. And so he says in verse 18, The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so after the explanation, he says again, The woman represents here the great city which, as we mentioned, will be mystery Babylon, or as we said, Rome. And not just a city, but it's also a system of apostate religion, which Babylon originated. The focus in this chapter is on the age-old apostate religious system and its relation to government. During the first half of the tribulation, it will be an ecumenical worldwide body that will come about. And think about how the Antichrist does it. Millions of Christians are gone. And he comes in with peace, as we had studied. And, and, and he wants to, to show the world that he can be a peaceful person. He has answers. People will be trying to figure out why the answers uh, of, of why all these Christians are gone. And he will come with, with the so-called answer and he will unite the religions of the world under one system, ecumenical. And um, he will come in with this government. And if you remember, we studied it, that this thing called the abomination of desolation that happens in the middle of the tribulation. That's when he gets the woman off his back. 
he goes into the temple. He's like, I don't need you anymore. And he goes in there and he says, I'm God, worship me. And then he wants this worship throughout the rest of the tribulation and he's ruling the world and then Christ comes back and then destroys him. What a time that's going to be. Let's pray. If you remember, as we've talked about this over these last months and even over these couple of years as we've been studying this book, we talked about the fact that the rapture or this catching up of the church can occur at any moment. And when the catching up of the church occurs, those who have never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be left behind. And I suppose that there are two categories of those who are left behind. Those who heard the gospel in power and clarity and, and have rejected it. And those who have never heard the gospel in power and clarity. And for those who have never heard the gospel in power and clarity, many of them will become saved during the tribulation. But for those who have heard the gospel with power and clarity and they are given an opportunity to respond to Christ and they say, eh, not yet, I'll wait, I'm not ready yet. Or I don't know about this rapture stuff or catching up stuff. When it happens, then maybe I'll believe it. The Bible tells us, as we looked at even this morning, that God will send on those people a deluding influence. So they'll believe what is false. They'll believe a lie. They'll believe in the Antichrist, and those people will be damned to hell. And so the fact of the matter is, because we are sitting here, it still means that we have life and we have an opportunity. And so if you're here this morning, you never place your faith and trust in Christ. God loves you. He sent Jesus Christ to this world and Christ willingly came to die for the sins of the whole world. And as a result, the invitation is put out there that you can, by faith, receive this gift of salvation. For it's by grace we've been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. It's not as a result of works so that no one can boast. And so if you know and you look within your heart and you say, I've never put my faith in Christ. I'm putting my faith in other things to try and get to heaven or to try and appease the wrath of God. then it's time to turn from that and to turn to Christ. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means anyone. You could call on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved, call on the name of the Lord this morning. You could say, Lord Jesus, I now know why you came into this world. This world was corrupt with sin. And you had to solve that problem. Couldn't be solved any other way permanently. But you've come into this world to solve the sin problem. And you tell me that I can have my sins forgiven if I put my faith and trust in you. Maybe you will call out to God right now and ask him to save you and Lord God for anyone here this morning who's never placed their faith and trust in you I ask that you would work in their hearts even now and that they would 
today. Turn from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And Lord, we present this invitation with your blessings in the name of Christ. Amen. As we stand and